Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have my friend, Matthew Barrett. Matthew, welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, brother. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. I think we're setting a record here. I think you've been on now seven times. So, um, <laughs> I, I think you're officially like probably one of my favorite guests. So thank you so much, brother. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I appreciate uh, all of your listeners and um, uh, how serious they are about learning theology yeah wonderful brother well can you catch us up on briefly on what's been happening in the last i think year or so in your life marriage ministry and those types of things yes well uh i i teach uh systematic theology at midwestern baptist theological seminary so that keeps me pretty busy most days but i also am the host of the Credo podcast and the editor of Credo magazine. So little little commercial here. If you know any of your listeners and enjoy your podcast, Dave, I'm sure they they might uh, enjoy the Credo podcast as well. I'm constantly talking to you know uh, fellow theologians about some of the most important issues that matter. And then uh, the 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 th- one thing that's been occupying most of my attention, which we're going to talk about, is the doctrine of the Trinity. And my book, Simply Trinity: The Un manipulated father son and spirit just released by baker books wonderful brother wonderful well i know you've been working hard on this project this sim- simple trinity the unmanipulated father son and spirit can you tell us why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received please over the years i've noticed something a bit uh, disturbing and uh, you know as as evangelicals even within the reformed um uh, the reform camp, broadly speaking, we tend to assume that the doctrine of the Trinity that we've been taught and uh, the doctrine that we just kind of assume in so many of our evangelical textbooks, we just assume, well, this is just the biblical doctrine. This is just pure Bible. Uh, but over the years, as I've taught the doctrine of the Trinity and have uh, read deeper, just in terms of the history of the church, uh, going back to, say, the Nicene Creed, for example, I've noticed that, well, actually, there's there seems to be Trinity drift afoot. And uh, why is that? Well, for starters, uh, we we seem to be suspicious. Uh, even at times, we reject uh, key doctrines like uh, the eternal generation of the Son. On top of that, we, in the 20th century, we have a, a really bad habit of redefining the Trinity more in terms of a society. And this uh, redefinition of the Trinity. This has been a very popular move in the la- in the 20th century and in recent decades uh, with the rise of what's called social Trinitarianism. And uh, as I've read just about you know every book on the Trinity I can get my hands on, I've noticed that by redefining the Trinity in social terms, uh, we then in all kinds of ways, sometimes intentionally, sometimes uh, unintentionally, but we then use the Trinity for just about every social agenda under the sun. This kind of gets at the subtitle of my book, The Unmanipulated Trinity, because as I've uh, looked at uh, the, the flurry of, you know, Trinity books over the last century, it's become very, very clear. And I'm not the first one to observe this. Uh, others have made this observation as well, but it's become very clear that there is a tendency to manipulate the Trinity uh, for a variety of social agendas. In other words, the Trinity simply becomes becomes our social program, whether it's for politics, ecology, uh, whether it's for our view of uh, church government, or even gender. Uh, And the list is is really quite endless. So uh, all that to say, this Trinity drift is a bit shocking, and we don't always realize it. It's sometimes very subtle, uh, but I think it's very real. And so I'm arguing in my book that it's time for us to return home. We need to go back and uh, put aside um, 
this redefinition of the Trinity and go back and 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 really uh, do the hard work of understanding uh, the Trinity in its biblical and orthodox formulation. Yeah, that's that's really really good. And and, and guys, I what I really love about this book is that it's so it is uh, it is heavy in that it is pretty very theological as you would expect with Dr. Barrett, but it's also very easy to understand. Um, mm-hmm. I really appreciate how you break down um, theological words how you use lots of examples so that people can really get it. And so this will kind of uh, draw out this this next question. What is what is the biblical definition of the Trinity explained in layman's terms? Yes, well, uh, it's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? Because, of course, we're talking about the infinite, eternal, and incomprehensible God. <laughs> and so there's a, um, a proper uh, respect for divine mystery, of course, uh, in which I guess the good news is that we will be spending all of eternity in the new heavens and new earth um, uh, knowing this triune God because he is incomprehensible. Um, well, we will need eternity, won't we? But that said, um, when we describe the Trinity, I guess the first thing I want to say is what, uh, how we should not define the Trinity. Uh, the popular common assumption today, very common move, uh, not just in the church, but also in academia, is to just assume that we define the Trinity uh, in a way that is analogous to uh, our own human experience in our own human society. And so people will uh, look at how you and I and others uh, interact with each other as persons, and then they just assume, uh, oh, uh, that's that must just be how the persons of the Trinity uh, are defined. And that that's a very uh, dangerous and disastrous move to make, because for one, it tends to project our human qualities and assumptions of about society back onto uh, the infinite God, and and that's that can be quite that can have some major consequences. So uh, we want to avoid that. How then do we define the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, the first thing we need to say is that this is the one God we are talking about. Uh, this we are referring to here. Here we're to bring in a theological term. Um, we are referring to this idea of divine simplicity, and so that's why the title of my book, Simply Trinity. Here I'm putting the emphasis on the simply part, right? That God is, not only is there one God, but God is one. Uh, Emphasis there on the word is. In other words, he's not made up of parts. Uh, He's not composed or compounded. Uh, That would certainly make him divisible and corruptible um, and mutable. Rather, we are referring to the one undivided, simple God. So by simple, we don't mean like basic and easy to understand. By simple, we mean indivisible. And that said, who is this one simple, indivisible God? Well, uh, he is none none other than the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, that brings us to the 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 basic question of well, how then do we distinguish these persons? Uh, if these persons are one in essence, what is it that distinguishes them? And uh, as the church fathers studied scripture, looking at uh, the gospel of John, the book of Hebrews, the way Hebrews uh, quotes from the Psalms, uh, the apostle Paul and say Colossians 1, as they looked at uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament whole canon, they recognized, ah, there is, there is one thing alone that distinguishes the persons, and these are what we would call eternal relations of origin. Now, uh, what do they mean by that? Well, I know that's a a bit of a mouthful and and a fancier theological phrase, but actually, if we think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Here, it's eternal. So we're not referring to the way, say, human persons interact in time and space. No, this is the eternal God, and we're referring to their origin, uh, that is, uh, their eternal origin. And we're, we're asking the question, you know, what is their relation? And by that, we don't mean relation relationships like you and I have in in a very like separate individualistic sense. Uh, Rather, here we're referring to the relation of origin. So let's just take an example. And when we talk about uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, we can say, well, what is the Son's eternal relation of origin? Well, Scripture actually reveals this to us in the very name that it gives to us. Uh, There's a reason it calls him Son. It calls him Son because he is from his father. 
uh, and that's why he's called Father. <laughs> it's almost too simple to say, right? But uh, when we're referring to this son, the, the second person of the Trinity, well, this is not uh, a son like you and I might be a son and, and have a father. No, he is the eternal son. And so uh, one of the ways that Scripture uh, describes this is to say, oh, this is the son who is begotten. He is begotten from the Father's essence and from all eternity. And this alone distinguishes the Son as Son. And likewise, when they came to the Spirit, uh, they recognized that the Spirit, well, we say Spirit because this is the Spirit who is spirated. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And of course, all of this assumes that the Father uh, is the one who is without origin. Uh, he is unbegotten. Uh, he's not a Father who himself has a Father. He is the Father of, of the Eternal Son. So, all that to say, notice how uh, when we define the Trinity, uh, we do so in a way that preserves their simplicity and equality of essence, and at the same time, recognize that that one essence subsists in, in these three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. How do we identify that? Well, we then refer to these eternal relations of origin. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Spirit as spirated. It's a beautiful, blessed mystery, and one that uh, uh, unfortunately has been forgotten in recent days, and that is to our terrible detriment. Yeah, that, that's a really good explanation. Well, you're, you were just touching on how it's been forgotten, but um, in, in your book, you also say that the church has the wrong unorthodox view of the Trinity. Isn't that a controversial statement, brother? Yeah, and here I'm referring to uh, the, the our recent 20th century and uh, even the 21st century. It is a bit shocking and jarring uh, to be just blunt blunt about it, how many evangelicals have jettisoned um, the core components of the biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. And so uh, it's, it's a what the real controversy is the fact that it is a controversy, <laughs> if that makes sense, uh, because it, it shouldn't be. Uh, for the first century uh, through the, the uh, 18th century, um, how we just described the Trinity, uh, that was the biblical and orthodox way of doing so. You see it laid out in the most one of the most important uh, creeds the church has confessed, the Nicene Creed, one that I encourage pastors to learn today and uh, to teach to their people. And, and yet, when we come to the 20th century, there's been a suspicion and sometimes even just an outright disregard for components of the Nicene Creed and like eternal generation or uh, doctrines like divine simplicity, which has fallen on very hard times. And uh, this raises the question, well, if we are uh, so quick to abandon uh, these key components of, of Christian orthodoxy, have we actually abandoned orthodoxy itself? That's the real question. And it puts us um, just in total conflict with the church that's come before us that has confessed the biblical doctrine of the Trinity this way for a reason. We also see, I think, in uh, more recent days, you know, on the one hand, you have in the 20th century, uh, the rise of social Trinitarianism, and uh, you have individuals like Jurgen Moltmann, for example, um, who not only redefines the Trinity in terms of the society, um, but in doing so has led uh, many other social Trinitarians down the path. Uh, down a path that brings on the charges of, of tritheism. How's that? Well, uh, if we define the, redefine the Trinity as a type of society, uh, w well, this is a society then in which uh, the persons have their own individual centers of consciousness and will. Uh, sometimes they've even said there's three wills in the Trinity. And of course, this brings in the accusation against them of how this cannot be uh, tritheistic. Uh, because because if you have uh, three different centers of consciousness and will, you no longer have a, um, a trinity in which uh, the person share the one simple essence and will uh, with one another. What's what's a bit uh, disturbing, I think, is that uh, when you come to the evangelical movement in the last three decades, you'll notice that evangel major evangelical philosophers and then also the
theologians have gone this route as well. Um, they've been suspicious of God's simplicity, and at times some of them have even gone so far as to say there's uh, three centers of consciousness and will in the Trinity. Now, uh, some some have so uh, this is this is uh, along these lines as well. Some have also so redefined the Trinity as a society uh, that they have said, well, um, there's even. Uh, in the imminent life of God, that is apart from the world, apart from creation, apart from salvation, there's even hierarchy. Uh, there's even a type of uh, functional uh, subordination uh, within the imminent, imminent trinity. Um, and that, of course, uh, not only brings on those charges of tritheism, because, well, then how do you not need uh, separate uh, wills? Um, how does that not then divide the persons into their own uh, essence, but it also then brings on the charges of uh, a type of, uh, in recent days, a type of um, semi-Arianism, a type of subordinationism uh, in which the Father has a greater glory, a greater authority, and the Son a lesser one. That That is completely novel and foreign uh, to the history of the church, and one that really does put evangelicals at odds with the biblical and orthodox witness. So all kinds of challenges of late, and uh, these are challenges that should shock us a little and make us wonder, well, have we drifted? Uh, how, have we drifted from, from the scriptures and from uh, the, the trinity of our fathers? Yeah, that's really good. Well, I know something that's really important to you is returning to the sources. And I really like this example in your book about the dream team. Uh, can you tell us who is on the dream team and why they are important? Yeah, well, this is the fun part, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, in my book, I start off uh, having a little bit of fun um, and talking not only about uh, Trinity Drift, but um, as I make my case for uh, returning back to a biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, I introduce us to the dream team. I, I kind of uh, cross pollinate here different, uh, you know, different metaphors and examples. Uh, on the one hand, I use the uh, Back to the Future, uh, that epic movie, right, that uh, so many of us love and say we need to uh, get in the DeLorean and we need to go back in time and uh, rediscover our roots. And by doing so, we might just be able to uh, safeguard our future. But as we do so, well, who is it exactly that we need to pay attention to? And that's where I introduce us to the dream team, uh, that famous, you know, Olympic basketball team uh, that included, you know, of course, individuals like Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, uh, you know, the GOAT, um, uh, Michael Jordan, and so many others, Charles Barkley. And uh, from there, I argue argue, we, we need a type of dream team uh, to help us uh, be faithful in our interpretation of the scriptures. And um, here I, I talk about uh, individuals like Athanasius uh, or the Cappadocian fathers, uh, Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nisa and Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, I also talk about individuals in the West like uh, Augustine, for example, and so, so many more. Um, I even throw in there uh, a medieval individual like Thomas Aquinas and some Puritans like John Owen, for example. Well, uh, those who are listening, uh, you can uh, read that opening chapter uh, in which I, I introduce you to the dream team. The point, though, is to say, listen, we uh, have, have a bad habit of misinterpreting the scriptures, reading our agenda into the scriptures when we come uh, to the doctrine of the Trinity. And so uh, we need help. Uh, and this takes, a, this takes humility. It really does take humility. Uh, we have to recognize that we are standing on the shoulders of others. Um, and uh, if we're going to ensure that we are interpreting the scriptures correctly, then we need to look for help from those from the best Bible interpreters of the past uh, who can come alongside of us and, and help us and, uh, make sure that, that we are being faithful to the doctrine of the Trinity and not actually going to the right or to the left uh, in a way that would compromise either the 
the simplicity of the Father, Son, and Spirit, or these uh, eternal relations of origin that that we talked about, I think uh, listeners will be pleasantly surprised because they uh, are introduced to, you know, maybe an Athanasius or maybe an Augustine. They'll start to notice that uh, these this dream team not only wants to teach them and reintroduce them to to a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity, but they want to do so for the purpose of helping us rightly understand the gospel of salvation and even the Christian life. And I think uh, that that is a, a far better uh, mentality than the more recent mentality of the, the last century, which is uh, to, to, to use the Trinity in all kinds of ways to kind of take the Trinity down and use the Trinity in all kinds of ways for our, our different social agendas. Uh, two very, very different approaches. Yeah. And I think one of the most powerful things that you do in the book is use those examples because, you know, people might be wondering, okay, well, that's really complex, but but where's the church stood on this, you know, yeah. subject? And, you know, I think that pers- my personal opinion is that we and the church have an aversion to church history. So yes. using those examples really, really not only reinforces your point, but it, it really proves that, hey, this is what the church has taught. This is who it who has stood on the this for this doctrine. And so, you know, I, I think that is really, really helpful. It's something that I tried to I'm trying to do more of in my writing. Um mm. because for the reasons that, you know, y- you would agree with, you know, just showing, hey, this is what the church has taught. You know, not that we're saying, hey, this is above scripture, but we're saying this is we're coming alongside, you know, with the church history and tradition. And um, these are teachers that God has given the church. And so we're we're standing with them and and standing upon their their shoulders. So yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, I, I think that uh, as we as we do that, uh, actually, we'll discover that we have a better understanding of scripture. Uh, that's it's far more rich. Uh, it, it pays attention to context better, and uh, we'll notice that we're not trapped by some of the superficial insights of our own day, but actually we're we're taken back to the scriptures and, and shown insights that we tend to be blind to today. Yeah, that's really good. Well. You- You've been touching on this subject, but uh, here's here's the question: How does how does our understanding of the Trinity impact our understanding of the gospel? Yeah, you know that's a such a good question. I'm so glad you asked it because uh, you know obviously when we talk about the Trinity, uh, we're talking about some some difficult. Sometimes can, they can be hard to understand concepts. You know, I always tell you know students um, don't get frustrated by that. Um, because after all, this is God we're talking about. So why would we assume? <laughs> why would we assume that we can somehow, you know, wrap our minds around this infinite and eternal God we we are worshiping? Uh, if we could, we we probably wouldn't want to worship Him. Uh, that said, when we discuss the Trinity and and when we are careful to actually define the Trinity in a way that's that's right and accurate, uh, I think that those listening will be pleasantly surprised to discover that, oh, actually uh, doing the hard work of uh, learning theology has enormous consequences then for my understanding of the gospel, of salvation, and even the Christian life. Uh, Just to give one example of this, right? You know, I mentioned that crucial doctrine of eternal generation taught in the Nicene Creed, uh, a doctrine that appears throughout John's gospel, but also uh, throughout uh, the rest of the canon of Scripture in all kinds of ways. Um, well, this is really essential then for understanding um, the foundation on which the gospel stands. Uh, think of it this way: Why is it that why is it that the Father? sends the Son uh, to be incarnate uh, for us and our salvation? Well, that's a gospel question, isn't it? But uh, the answer is because, uh, well, it is fitting that the Father send the Son for the sake of our salvation, because this is the Son who is begotten from the Father from all eternity. Uh, One way that theologians have put this is uh, they have pointed out that well, the mission of the Son reveals the procession of the Son. Missions reveal processions. Perhaps we can put it that way. And uh, that means then that who 
We don't want, on the one hand, to confuse the two. Uh, we don't want to confuse or mix or conflate. That's a very popular tendency today to conflate who God is in and of himself with how God, how God then works in the economy of salvation. Uh, we don't want to conflate those two. That that can be disastrous. And yet at the same time, we we also re- recognize, well, who God is in and of himself is, is foundational. It's foundational then for how then he uh, goes about these missions uh, that concern our salvation. Uh, likewise, we can say something similar about the whole, about the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we refer to the Spirit uh, being given to us um, at Pentecost, or the Spirit being given to indwell us uh, as, as children of God, well, the reason that is so fitting is because this is the same Spirit uh, who proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Uh, so again, notice the correspondence there. Uh, all that to say, when we talk about the gospel, hopefully we are assuming these biblical and orthodox categories. But like you kind of hinted at a minute ago, Dave, I, I fear at times that um, more often than not, um, Christians are completely unaware of them. And then if there's any, you know, talk of, uh, you know, theology or let alone history, uh, people just check out and, and that sort of thing. We we do that, though, to our own detriment, because uh, if we don't understand who this God is, we then risk um, misunderstanding what he has done in salvation history. That's uh, that's really, really well said. What will the future look like for evangelicals if our present trajectory as it relates to the contri- relates to the Trinity continues to mimic the recent past? Well, I think something has to change. Um, and uh, I say this, you know, with, with boldness because um, we can get quite comfortable. Uh, we have, you know, our, our own evangelical camp, uh, even our own, re- you know, reformed, uh, camp, and uh, we like to think, well, if there's any air, if there's any drift afoot, it must be out there somewhere with with uh, somebody else over there in you know modern theology. Well, that type of mindset, uh, really, it can be a, a type of arrogance, is uh, very dangerous because it then um, assumes that uh, we ourselves are never at risk or in or in need of reform form, right? And that's where I want to say to to people today, uh, it's becoming more and more obvious in the last decade that uh, actually, for all the good that's gone on, actually, we've been quite weak on the doctrine of the Trinity. And we have misstepped in many, many ways, uh, both with uh, simplicity uh, and with those eternal relations of origin, like eternal generation. Uh, We don't always realize it, but uh, we have kind of breathed in the air of social Trinitarianism in ways that have affected us. Uh, You know, I gave the example of the way that some evangelicals want to insert and project hierarchy uh, within the imminent life of God, a very dangerous move. Well, these are all examples of ways that we've drifted and we've breathed in the air of modern theology, perhaps without realizing it. All that to say, um, I think what needs to happen is we we need to take a hard look at our Trinitarian theology, and we need to, um, like you said, Dave, we need to uh, go back to the sources. We need to, to recognize, okay, we have been influenced by modern theology more than we want to admit, but let's not, let's not double down and keep going that direction. Instead, let's reform. Uh, let's be about, let's, let's, let's have hu- the humility necessary necessary to begin a type of reformation that will bring us back home to a biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. I think there's encouraging signs lately. Uh, this, that's the reason why I've written this book, Simply Trinity, to, to help um, students, pastors, churchgoers alike, to help you uh, begin that process, to introduce you to both the problem but and, and the virus itself, but also to show you the antidote as well. And and there's been just encouraging signs um, with some other books releasing lately.
directly on the doctrine of the Trinity that this is happening. It's starting to happen. It's a slow process, but it's starting to happen. We we're recognizing it, and I think in in time, um, I think it, it'll be a bit of a of a struggle. But I think in time, uh, you'll start to see uh, not only books, but perhaps even systematic theologies written from a very different standpoint, trying to take us back to our um to our biblical and orthodox heritage wonderful brother well i, I look forward to your systematic theology on the trinity <laughs> <laughs> well all joking aside where where can people go to find out more about your work online either on social media or otherwise brother yeah thank you uh well of course you know pick up simply trinity um you can find it you know everywhere books are sold i would say if you want to find out more you know i've been doing a uh, a series of uh video conversations on youtube and on uh credo uh with fellow theologians on the doctrine of the trinity we're doing you know about 12 of them those are fantastic those you know just walk you through some of the basics i also have a uh um, course uh, called the, uh, just called the Trinity with the For the Church Institute. It's free, uh, so you can go to the For the Church website, uh, the For the Church Institute website, and if you click on the Trinity course, uh, log in. You will have there ten short lectures. They're about fifteen minutes each, in which I walk you through the basics of a biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, that could be a great place just to you know. If if, if you're listening to this and you feel like, you know, I, I've never studied the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't know where to begin. Uh, those are short lectures that are fun. I have a little fun with them, but, but then we also get serious and learn the key vocabulary and concepts. And I think that if you do do that, you'll then feel like, okay, I, I think I'm ready to dive a little bit deeper. I think the ultimate thing I would say though, is, you know, um, you know, not, not merely my book or, or that, that sort of thing, but ultimately I would just encourage Christians out there to read the scriptures with fresh eyes, but don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Uh, read the scriptures and do so and invite, uh, you know, invite uh, an Augustine or an Athanasius to sit in the recliner next to you and, and have a conversation about the scriptures you're reading. That's really good, brother. Well, I do want to encourage our listeners. Um, you mentioned this at the beginning. So I do want to encourage our listeners to check out the Credo podcast. I'm pretty sure I've listened to just about every episode. I might be a little bit behind, but you will learn <laughs> so much from that podcast. I cannot tell you, you know, it is so good. And it's it's not like super, it is academic, but it's not like over the top. So you'll really enjoy that. And even if you don't have a master's of divinity or any kind of theological degree, you'll really enjoy that. And in the same way, I encourage you to check out Credo Magazine and all the articles that that Credo puts out. Um, very good stuff. Well, brother, um, just as we wrap up, do you want to give our listeners a few takeaways? Yeah, I, I, I guess as a you know a few final thoughts. Uh, I would say this: first of all, don't be afraid of the deep things of God. Um, you should come to them with fear and reverence, um, but um, don't buy into that mentality. So popular today uh, that, uh, well, the deep things of God are are not, not really important. And uh, actually, I think you'll discover in reading Simply Trinity, uh, as you dive into this deep doctrine of the Trinity, that this is incredibly important uh, because uh, not only does your doctrine of God hang in the balance, but your worship, uh, your worship of God hangs in the balance. And then the second thing I would say is just a, a little bit of a takeaway here is link arms with me and join me. Let's join hands together and uh, let's uh, let's walk forward by walking back, <laughs> if that makes sense. In other words, let's link arms together and with humility, let's return, walk back towards uh, the, the biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity uh, so that those who come after us are in a much better state uh, than our own day. Um, I know that's a big task, but it is one that is so crucial because this is the Trinity after all. Uh, it's hard to think of anything that could be more important. So to use the uh, illustration from my book, um, uh, take a ride with 
with me in, in my uh, DeLorean and let's go back in time uh, and recover and retrieve the biblical and orthodox doctrine of the Trinity that is so uh, despised today. Let's retrieve it uh, for the sake of our future. Wonderful, brother. Well, guys, we've been talking today with Dr. Matthew Barrett, author of Simple Simply Trinity, the Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit. Dr. Barrett, thank you so much for your time today and for the ministry at Midwestern and through your writing and credo, uh, your blessing to the church. Brother. Thank you for having me, Dave. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.